Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, on behalf of the World Affairs Council Town Hall here in Los Angeles, it's uh, it's a pleasure to have you and to uh, begin this evening with the Dan Schnorr Political Report. Uh, I'm uh, Richard Downey, the President and CEO of the Los Angeles World Affairs Council Town Hall, and it's great to have all of you with us here today. Uh, you know, I I I'm sure all of you have heard that Chinese curse that says. Uh, may you live in interesting times. And uh, it seems like we're living in some very interesting times at the moment, you know, with the assassination uh, attempt on former President Trump last Saturday, uh, the all that's going on with the Republican convention right now, uh, the chorus of Democrats asking President Biden to step down. I mean, it's most recently Adam Schiff, even George Clooney, and and reportedly, Nancy Pelosi and, and Barack Obama. So uh, you know, it's it's a uh, things are going on, and thank heaven, we have Dan Schnur here with us to help us understand the impact of all of these issues. Uh, we certainly also want you to be a part of this conversation, and you can do that by going down to the bottom of your screen at any time during the uh, during this session, and, and go to the Q and A button, and you can type in your question. And after about a half hour or so, uh, Katie Gilman will moderate the questions and, uh, and, and go back with Dan. And you can, but anytime you can, can go down there. Uh, I also want to want to mention Katie Gilman is uh, is in New York City. So we really appreciate her being here. As a matter of fact, some of you will probably recognize this, this background here. This is where Katie used to sit. I'm, I'm sitting here now. But uh, we also have, I want to introduce Madison Alt, who is our new uh, communication, uh, communications manager, and you'll get all, uh, all a chance to meet uh, Madison here very soon. Uh, but we're glad to have Madison, we're, and we're very appreciative of having Katie with us tonight and for all she does. Um, I, I do want to mention, before we head over to Dan, I, I'd like to ask a favor of all of you. You know, the, the Los Angeles World Affairs Council and Town Hall is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization. And like all nonprofit organizations, we really need funds to help us continue to uh, pay the expenses to allow us to, to have this program and, and the kind of programs that you want to have and see. So uh, we would really appreciate it if, if you would do one of three things. One, it would be, we would love to have uh, sponsors for this program and others. So if you or your company would be willing to sponsor this program for the year, for a period, we would be delighted. We'd recognize you and or your company and the support that you give on all of our marketing materials and thank you in various ways. Uh, if, if that's not possible, if you could go to our website, there's a big button on top of the, the, the homepage there that says donate. If you could uh, click and give as much as you can, or uh, at a minimum, if you could join the World Affairs Council uh, town and town hall, again, going to our website and uh, on the homepage or on the membership page, if you could, could join, we would be uh, delighted and it would help a, a big deal. But we, you know, we don't use a paywall for this, uh, for this show and we hope we to be able to continue these shows uh, that, that you really look forward to and, and, and I do too. So. Uh, as, as we all look forward to Dan Schnorr, let me turn it over to Dan now for what will be a very interesting discussion on what's going on now. Dan, please. 
Well, Richard, thank you very much uh, for the kind introduction. And I'll echo his appeal to all of you. We've all, we're always very, very grateful to our members and our other supporters uh, for the generosity you show us. And it's something that really does help us keep doing this kind of programming. So thank you in advance for continuing to be so supportive. Richard mentioned, of course, uh, that today is our friend Katie Gilman's last uh, episode with us. And we thanked her very lavishly last month and we will again before the end tonight, just to warn you. And like Richard, I'm very, very excited to be working with Madison going forward. But in addition to the personnel change, I thought this would be a good opportunity to give you a little bit of a glimpse behind the scenes of how we plan for these types of programs. So originally when we were putting together the schedule of webinars for the summer, um, Katie and I talked and then went to Richard with a proposal that we scheduled the July webinar tonight on the final day of the Republican convention. We thought the timeliness of talking about the convention on its final night, after the first three days of presentations, after the announcement of Trump's running mate, and immediately before Trump's speech to the RNC into the country, we thought this timing would work out very well. And obviously we would spend most, if not all of our time tonight talking about the convention and what it means, just like next month, we'll do something very similar for the Democratic convention. So that was the original idea. To hold this thing on the last night of the Republican convention so we can talk about the convention. But then over the last couple of weeks, or actually in the last three weeks since the presidential debate, it became clear to us that in addition to talking about the Republican convention, we would also need to spend some time tonight talking about the debate over President Biden after the debate, uh, his performance in, in that debate, the way his party and many other voters responded to it. We knew this was a topic that our uh, regular participants would want to hear about. So we met last week, uh, Madison and Katie and I, to plan out tonight's program to talk about both the convention and about Biden's status on the ticket. Then, of course, Saturday night, as all of you know, uh, the young man in Pennsylvania attempted to assassinate former President Trump. And along with all of the very important real world consequences of that action or that attempted action, I should say, we talked about needing to revamp the program for tonight, to talk about the shooting, to talk about the convention, and to talk about Biden. But then just in the last 36 hours or so, it's become very clear that many leading Democrats are becoming increasingly convinced that Biden should not seek reelection. And so that's what we're starting with tonight. And I'll give you my overview of that discussion in just a minute. But before anything else, Madison, if I can ask you to post our first question for our audience to help frame the discussion over Joe Biden's future. So if we can see the first poll question when you're able. Okay, pretty straightforward, everybody. Not, I'm not, we're not asking you to predict. We're not asking you what you think will happen and whether Biden will stay on the ticket or not. This key word there is the second one, should. The question is, who in your opinion should be the Democratic nominee for president in 2024? Should it be Joe Biden? Should the president stay on the ticket? Should it be Kamala Harris? Uh, obviously under the circumstance in which Biden stepped aside. Or third, should it be someone else, another Democrat, a governor, a senator, a member of the cabinet? But let's get a sense from you on what your preference would be. Who do you think the Democratic nominee should be? And if we can put that up, Corey, thank you, Madison. Really interesting. Wow, and I have to tell you, I'm somewhat surprised by this. Only 18% of our group has says that they would like to see Joe Biden as the Democratic nominee for president. Less than one out of five of our audience, and we know from experience that our audience does lean toward the Democratic. So this is not Republican spoilers trying to make trouble. And I wonder if we'd asked this question even two or three days ago, if we would have seen such a low number for Biden. 18% for Biden, 29% of you, a little bit more than a quarter, 
believe that the nominee should be Kamala Harris. But 53%, more than half of our group, believe an other Democrat, other than Biden, other than Harris, ought to be the party's standard bearer against Donald Trump in November. And to me, what's really interesting here, I want to point this out, although I'm guessing most of you have already done the math for yourself. Let's add up those bottom two numbers. The fact that 29% say Harris, 53% say someone else. That means more than 80% of our group believes that Joe Biden ought to step away from the ticket. And that is a remarkable response. Wow. Now, let's take a look back over the last several days, because again, I, I believe that if we had asked this question a few days ago, let alone a week ago, we would have gotten much different answers. Um, late last week, it looked like Biden was beginning to regain his footing to some degree. You may remember, and I know it seems like months ago, but it was only seven days ago when Biden had what was arguably the most high stakes presidential news conference in modern American history. When Biden at the conclusion of the NAFTA summit met with reporters for about an hour answering their questions and was genuinely thought to have done not perfectly, but had done fairly well. And the general consensus, which I would subscribe to, is if Biden had performed in the debate two weeks earlier, the way he did in the news conference last Thursday, most of this conversation wouldn't be taking place. The next day, he did a rally in Michigan in which many of the reporters covering his campaign felt that he was as energized and motivating on the stump as he had been all year. And then Saturday, of course, the, the, shoot, the shootings in Butler, Pennsylvania, and the attempted assassination of Donald Trump really put a damper on any discussion in the Democratic Party about Biden's prospects, at least publicly. So while in the news media, the focus had shifted to Trump, to the attempted assassination, and looked like Biden was going to slide under the public debate for a period of time, the speculation and the discussion really never went away. On Saturday, it's now been reported, Biden had a couple of very contentious calls with two groups of House Democrats, and he had private meetings with both Chuck Schumer and Hakeem Jeffries, the Democratic leaders of the Senate and the House, respectively, of course. And in those meetings, Schumer in particular was especially emphatic about the damage that Biden's candidacy was causing to the rest of the ticket. So this went on, even through the weekend, even though we weren't seeing it or hearing it or reading it. Then as the week began, uh, the, the rumble started up again. But yesterday, just 24 hours, in the last 24 hours or so, it seems to me, was the day, Wednesday of this week was the day in which Joe Biden's political castle began to crumble. First Adam Schiff, the rep representative from California, who's the odds on favorite to become our next US Senator, came out calling for Biden to step aside. And although roughly 20 other Democratic members of Congress had already done so, of course, Schiff, by virtue of his visibility throughout the Trump impeachment, and by virtue of his likely ascension to the Senate later this year, really did send a much stronger message. The other thing that made Schiff's announcement yesterday so important, as most of you know, is how close Adam Schiff is with Nancy Pelosi. Remember, Speaker Pelosi picked Adam Schiff to chair the Trump impeachment hearings. That's how highly she thinks of him. Remember that when Schiff announced his candidacy for Senate against two other respected Democratic House members, Katie Porter and Barbara Lee, Nancy Pelosi weighed in fully for Schiff and helped him uh, make it into the runoff against the Republican candidate, Steve Garvey, without much trouble at all. And so it's pretty clear that Schiff would not have become public with his call yesterday if Pelosi hadn't wanted him to, 
And while she's been somewhat circumspect in public on this, the fact that her loyal ally and friend Schiff was speaking out was widely interpreted in democratic circles around the country. That Pelosi, arguably the most influential Democrat in the country outside of the administration, even more perhaps than Barack Obama, had given uh, Schiff the go-ahead to weigh in the way he did. The other news that broke yesterday is Jeffrey Katzenberg, uh, the movie mogul who's been the chair of the Biden campaign and Biden's chief fundraiser. It was reported yesterday that Katzenberg had met with Biden and told him that because of all the speculation about his future and because of Biden's performance in the debate and on the campaign trail, Katzenberg told him that the fundraising was drying up. And just to give you one example of that, uh, there's, a, a, there's a special fund that the campaign uses for especially large donors. And this fund last in the month of June, last month, raised about $50 million, which was pretty much on track with what they'd been raising on a monthly basis throughout the year. What Katzenberg apparently told Biden yesterday is that the projections are that they would only raise half of that for July if they were lucky and the money really was going away. And on top of all of that, of course, Joe Biden then tests positive for COVID. Today, there's leaks that Barack Obama has told his allies that Biden's chances for re-election have dramatically diminished. And just a couple of hours ago, for those of you who didn't see it, the Washington Post reported that Pelosi is telling some House Democrats that she believes the president could be persuaded to withdraw from the race in the next several days. So really in the last 24 to 36 hours, an awful lot has happened that's dramatically remade the political landscape, which I believe, Katie, is what led us to seeing such imbalanced poll results from our group as we did a, as we did a few minutes ago. Mm -hmm. Well, Dan, thank you so much for what has already been a really interesting discussion. It's, as you mentioned, just been in a uh, really crazy week for all Americans. Um, but I wanted to chime here, chime in here and ask you, what is the biggest benefit of having Biden stay on the ticket? And alternatively, what is the biggest benefit of replacing Biden? A great question. Uh, so if you are a Democrat, either a Democratic voter or a Democratic Party leader, this is a really difficult decision. And even though it looks like more and more leading Democrats are leaning toward replacing Biden on the ticket. This isn't an easy call. The biggest benefit of having, having Biden stay on the ticket um, is stability. Uh, we have not seen this type of late switch in a presidential campaign in the modern era. And even if you go back to previous contested conventions, Ronald Reagan versus Gerald Ford for the Republican nomination in 1976, Carter versus Kennedy for the Democratic nomination in 1980. These were candidates who'd run against each other for months and months and months and were already very familiar with party regulars and party delegates. You have to go back to 1968 when Lyndon Johnson withdrew from the race before we saw a similar circumstance. So the stability uh, is an argument in Biden's favor. And as Biden himself correctly points out, he's the only person who's ever beaten Donald Trump. And it's important to remember that not just that he beat Trump in 2020, but how he did it. If you're a Democrat, remember that it was Biden who gained the nomination because many Democrats believe correctly that he was the only leading Democrat who would be able to win back those working class blue collar voters in Rust Belt states like Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin. And no other Democrat, at least not at this level, has demonstrated that capability. So those are the benefits for keeping Biden on the ticket, and that's the argument he's been making. The downside, somewhat sadly, is that unlike most politicians who hit a tough stretch, who make a misstatement, make a gaffe, take an unpopular policy position, those are all errors that can be fixed. But the American public has decided simply that Joe Biden is too old to be president. And it's worth noting that they come to that conclusion long before the debate three weeks ago. And while a talented politician can convince voters of many, many things, no politician can convince them that they're younger than they are, 
that, that he's younger than he is. Uh, the American public's made up their mind about this. And for those who want to, Biden to leave the ticket, it's because through no fault of his own, the argument he has to make is an unwinnable one. Now, the, the, the logical follow-up question, which I'm going to ask Madison in just one minute to put to all of you, is this is a decision ultimately that Joe Biden himself has to make. If he decides to stay on the ticket even now, it'd be almost impossible to replace him as the party nominee. The question we have for all of you, and Madison, if you can post the next question, is knowing that it's Biden's decision to make, who would you have the most confidence in? Who would you trust most to make the decision of whether Biden should stay on the ticket? Is Biden the person who ought to be making that decision? Do you trust him to be able to have the perspective into his own fate to make a considered decision? Is it the Democratic congressional leaders, Chuck Schumer in the Senate, Akeem Jeffries in the House? They've been talking to their members. They've been surveying the competitive races. Should they be the ones whose voice should be, voices should be trusted on this? Third, how about Barack Obama? He's the most recent Democratic president before Biden. Joe Biden was Obama's vice president. Obama does have a very uh, considerably skilled uh, political uh, political mind, should he be making this decision? Nancy Pelosi, we've talked a little bit about her role in this. Or maybe Bill Clinton, who's a little bit further removed from this, but again, is very well respected both by his allies and his opponents for having a particularly acute understanding of American politics. So question for our group, Madison, let's see the answer. Who do you trust to make that decision? Wow, that is a split decision. 33%, almost exactly one third of our group, thinks the congressional leaders ought to be making the decision based on the potential impact, presumably, on House and Senate races. And that has been the argument that Schumer and Jeffries and Pelosi have been making to Biden. It's been reported. Uh, Biden himself and Obama and Pelosi all received roughly about the same percentage of the vote. 24% for Biden, 21 for Obama, and 20% for Nancy Pelosi, and only 1% think that Bill Clinton ought to be trusted with that decision. Uh, so it looks like that we've got a pretty strong consensus here. If we add Pelosi's 20% to the Schumer Jeffries response, that's 53% of how of congressional leaders, either current or recent. So it sounds like our group believes at least that the fight for control of Congress ought to be what determines the next steps. Very, very interesting. Don't, don't you think, Katie? I do, I do think that's really interesting. And I have loved getting this feedback from the audience, but I also want to ask you, who do you think would be the Democrats' best choice right now? Boy, I, I, I tend to agree with what our group said in answer to our first poll question. Um, when they, more than half of them said it should be someone other than Biden or Harris. Now, I want to hasten to say I, I do not mean any disrespect to Vice President Harris in that answer. But she is not held in particularly high regard by Democratic Party strategists. And her poll numbers are not all that different than Joe Biden's. Now, that doesn't mean that she couldn't be a good candidate. But I think what I would do, Katie, is rather than guess, rather than trying to be a soothsayer or a fortune teller and say, oh, I think Kamala Harris would be best. Oh, I think Gretchen Whitmer or Gavin Newsom would be the answer. I think the, I think the smartest thing for the Democratic Party right now would be to hold a very compressed nomination, competition for the nomination. And I would as David Walters, the former governor of Oklahoma, as a member of the Democratic National Committee has proposed, is said that any Democrat who can get at least 40 delegates to the Democratic National Convention to support their candidacy should be eligible to participate in a series of debates in the month leading up to the Democratic National Convention and would be given an opportunity to speak to the convention. And so for the Democratic Party, rather than trying to guess which governor, which senator, which cabinet member, which vice president would be the best candidate, take them out for a test 
And while that very abbreviated process wouldn't be nearly as long as the year or so that the primary process has turned into in modern day American politics, I think over the course of a month, party voters and more importantly, party delegates could get a sense of these men and women and with some confidence select a somewhat battle-tested candidate who had impressed them over the course of that month period and would therefore be at least somewhat well prepared to go into a general election against Trump. Who could that be? It could be Harris. She should be one of those people and she should have the opportunity to demonstrate her skills as a potential nominee. My point is it simply should not be given to her. She should compete for it. In addition to Kamala Harris, you heard me earlier mention Gretchen Whitmer, the governor of Michigan, Gavin Newsom, the governor of California, Josh Shapiro and Wes Moore, the governors of Pennsylvania and Maryland, respectively, perhaps a couple of cabinet members, Pete Buttigieg, the secretary of transportation, and Gina Raimondo, the secretary of commerce, and probably about a half a dozen others, J.B. Pritzker, the governor of Illinois, Raphael Warnock, the senator from Georgia, probably about a dozen or so all told who would be taken seriously by the body politic. And if six or seven or eight of them got a sufficient number of delegates to support their candidacy, then the country could spend the month watching them, debating and discussing the issues that will shape our future. And I think that would not only allow the Democratic Party to pick the best nominee, it could also have a very important energizing effect on the Democratic Party. Now, speaking of energy and motivation, let's segue into another topic. And we do want to talk at least briefly about last weekend's tragic events, because even though President Trump uh, survived the assassination attempt, tragically, others who were on the site of his rally did perish. Um, so it was a tragedy. And what I want to do before I get into this any further is once again, ask all of you, our group, what you thought about last weekend. So Madison, if we can put up the third question. Question number three, do you think the events of this past weekend will have an impact on the election? Yes, the events will help Trump. Or alternatively, yes, the events will help Biden. Or third, there will be no difference. What we'll do, if you can leave that up there for just another second, Madison, what we'll do, just given the conversation we've been having, which may have skewed the results on this, let's alter the second option here. We'll say, yes, the events of last weekend will help Trump's candidacy. The second option, say, yes, the events of last weekend will help the Democrats more broadly. And then third, no, there will be no difference. So let's go ahead and see those results. What have we got? 81%. And again, we know from past experience that this is a group that leans somewhat Democratic. More than four out of five of our group believes that the attempted assassination will help Trump's candidacy. And no question that most of the Republican Party believes that, uh, believes that as well. Only 1% believe it will help Democrats and 18% uh, don't think it will have much of an impact on the race. But no question, our group, like the delegates in Milwaukee, think by a very large margin that this is going to help Trump. And once again, Dan, I think it would be productive to get your thoughts on this as well as the audiences. So do you think that this weekend's week, weekend's events will impact the election? And if so, how? Uh, well, I, I agree with our group to a degree. There's no question that the immediate impact of the attempted assassination has galvanized the Republican Party for Trump. The party was already fairly united behind him certainly much more than they were in 2016, certainly much more than they were in 2022. It's worth remembering after the midterm elections, uh, Ron DeSantis was running well ahead of Trump uh, in polls among Republican primary voters. But a party that was already coming up together behind Trump, and we're seeing this every night on television from the convention, is extremely motivated, inspired, and excited by him. So there's no question that's provided, at least in the immediate a benefit to the Republicans in an election that many believe could be decided by which party's base is more motivated. Now, the question is, is can Democrats become as motivated without hopefully another assassination attempt? What could the Democrats do 
to motivate their supporters to turn out as enthusiastically as this seems to uh, be doing for the Republicans. I would say the one thing that might do that, going back to what we we're talking about a minute ago, Katie, is a compressed but competitive fight for the nomination. And if over the course of a one month period, Democrats and the country saw five, six, seven, eight leading Democratic uh, office holders vying for the nomination and debating their visions for the country's future, that is the potential. There's no guarantee, of course, but it's the potential to be a tremendously energizing uh, uh, impact for the Democrats. The, the, the biggest question, um, I think, more than how this shooting impacts the voters directly, either Republicans or Democrats, the biggest question to me by far is how does the shooting impact Trump himself? He, Trump, has done a couple of newspaper interviews in which he's talked with reporters about how the shooting impacted him. He said he had written a very aggressive, very combative, very Trumpish speech to give to the convention tonight that he's torn up. And he's talked about giving a more unifying speech. If you saw him when he came to the convention on Monday, you did not see a lot of the bombast that we normally associate with Trump. He seemed somewhat more subdued. If the shooting did have an effect on Donald Trump, as it may have, personally and emotionally, then I feel like that's going to change the campaign more than anything else. Um, on the other hand, Trump has succeeded in throughout his political career through being very combative and very confrontational. So it may be difficult for him to set that aside. But what I would encourage all of us to do tonight as we're watching the speech is watch for the tone from Trump. If you do get a sense that he is making an effort to be more unifying, that the near-death experience did have some type of an impact on him, that's going to tell us a lot. On the other hand, if we say, see the same, same Trump that we did in 2016 and we have since, well, that's going to tell us a lot more too. So now uh, we're just about, I want to get to our question, our audience questions in just a minute or two, Katie. But we do need to talk at least briefly about the Republican convention beyond the shooting. So what do you think we shift for just a few minutes over to that topic before we open it up for our audience questions? What do you think? Yeah, I think that's a great idea. I think we can get through some of the most important things uh, about the convention. So, and firstly, I want to ask you, why do you think that Trump chose J.D. Vance? Okay. So it's been widely reported that from Trump's original longer list of candidates to be his running mate, he had narrowed the list a few weeks ago to three people. Doug Burgum, the governor of North Dakota, Marco Rubio, the senator from Florida, and J.D. Vance, the senator from Ohio. And had, the, 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 it's, it's always, it's been said in politics that the selection of a running mate tells you more about the presidential nominee and their thinking than it tells you about the running mate. So I'd argue that you this, that had Trump picked Burgum, the governor of North Dakota, he would have picked him because he saw a vice president who could help him govern. Burgum is very well respected in Republican circles. He's a bit more subdued. He's been a very successful businessman who we, we know Trump replaces, uh, respects those kind of attributes. A Burgum selection would have been Trump saying, I want someone to help me govern. Had he picked Marco Rubio, his nemesis from the 2016 campaign, Trump would have picked Rubio if he felt he needed help to win the election. By picking a Latino, by picking a voter, a candidate who's been successful at reaching out to working class voters, that would have been Trump's way of saying, not only can he help me in Florida, which is a pretty deep red state at this point, but he can help me with Latino voters in swing states like Arizona and Nevada also. So a Rubio pick would have meant Trump wanted someone to help him win. But by picking J.D. Vance, to me, that demonstrates an immense amount of confidence on Trump's part. In other words, he doesn't think he needs help governing. He doesn't think he needs help to win. He's very confident he's going to get elected again in November. So he picked a J.D. Vance, picked a J.D. Vance, all of 39 years old, to represent the next generation of Trumpism. 
this selection was as much about 2028 and beyond as it was about 2024. So I suspect that uh, whether it was because of the shooting or a confidence that predated the Sadnet rally, Trump picked Vance because he feels he's going to win either way and has the luxury of making a longer term selection. Um, but maybe what we can do, Madison, is put up a question for our uh, for our group. Um, we're going to ask all of you, having had a chance to watch Vance over these last few days, how do you think J.D. Vance will affect Trump's chances of winning in November? Do you think having Vance on the ticket will make it more likely that Trump would win? Do you think it makes it less likely that he'll win? Or do you not think it makes any difference? And let's see those results once we get them. Yeah, 51%, more than half say no difference. But interesting for our group, by an almost two to one margin, 31% to 18%, it's interesting that our group believes almost two to one that Vance helps Trump more than he hurts him. Now we're gonna learn a lot more about Vance over the next 100 plus days. Generally speaking, our, I think our audience is correct. Generally speaking, running mates don't make a great deal of difference. But at least today, I think it is very notable that our group is much more likely to think he helps Trump rather than hurts him. And then finally, and then we will get to your questions in just a minute, I promise. Um, I do want to spend just a minute or two, and we can spend more time on this in the remaining 20, 25 minutes. But let's spend at least a few minutes talking about Trump's speech tonight, because shortly after the end of our webinar, Trump will be speaking to the convention and the nation. And this is, it's worth noting, Trump is the first politician, the first presidential candidate to be his party's nominee in three consecutive elections since Franklin Delano Roosevelt. This is pretty rare. So his speech has some historical import and obviously has a great deal of more immediate political import. Dan, what do you think that uh, Trump's goals are for his speech tonight? A really good question. And we're going to ask the audience in just a minute, as you know, Katie, which issues they think will be the focus of his speech. But I want to talk a little bit more broadly. Generally speaking, in most campaigns, for president, for governor, for senator, for most competitive partisan offices, campaign strategists believe that the key to winning is both, is, is twofold. It's both motivating your party's base, your most loyal supporters, motivating them to turn out. We've already talked a little bit about that. But second, also, it's equally important to persuade undecided voters. And what's been fascinating about this campaign to date is Susie Wiles and Chris LaCivita, who are Trump's two top strategists, have been very clear in public in interviews that they don't think they need to persuade undecided voters that they believe that if they can motivate a conservative base to turn out in sufficiently large numbers, that they'll win the election just on that. So if you have a campaign that doesn't see the need to talk to swing voters, what'll be interesting tonight is whether Trump really does speak only to his base to excite them, to motivate them to the greatest degree possible, or do they actually think that they need to win over some swing voters, particularly to win those key half a dozen or so states that'll decide that election. As we said earlier, Trump himself has said that he's edited his speech to take a less combative tone and talk more about bringing the nation together. That's the biggest question heading into tonight's speech, and there's no way to predict whether he's gonna follow it or not. So lastly, uh, before we do open it up to your questions, and for those of you who haven't, please send them in to Katie and Madison. Madison, well, let's put up the last poll question for our group. And then we'll move into the rest of their questions. So I told you what I thought more broadly uh, will be Trump's goals in this speech. But we're going to ask you a bit more specifically. What policy area do you think will be the focus of Trump's speech tonight? Do you think he will focus primarily on inflation in the economy? Do you think he'll talk a great deal, as the convention did last night, about immigration and crime? Will he talk about abortion and health care, particularly now that he's moved the party platform in his direction to call for state level decisions rather than a national ban on abortion? Will he talk about foreign policy, Ukraine, Gaza, perhaps China? 
Or will he talk about Biden's physical and mental health for all the reasons we talked about for the first 15 minutes or so of tonight's webinar? Obviously, he'll talk about most of these things, if not all of them. But which one do you think will get the most attention from Trump tonight? Do we have, uh, do we have results, Madison? Let's see what they have. In, wow, 65%, almost two-thirds. Look at that. Almost two-thirds of our groups believe that he will focus on immigration and crime issues. There's no question that public opinion polls shows that this is an issue base that works very effectively for him. Issues on which voters tend to prefer Biden, excuse me, Trump, in large numbers over Biden. Inflation in the economy and Biden um, are distant seconds, 18% and 15%. And 1% of you say foreign policy and not... Well, one of you, which runs out to 0%, I believe he'll talk a lot about abortion and health care. So look, we went a little bit long tonight, but obviously a lot to cover between Biden's future, between the convention, and between the near assassination of a former president. But let's spend the next 20 minutes, Katie, getting in as many of our group's questions as we can. And uh, I'll do my best to answer as many of them as possible. Perfect. Yeah, will do. We, as always, have a very eager audience. And I'm excited for um, our first audience question, which is actually going to be on screen. So I'd like to introduce Anita Rodal to the conversation. She is the president of SBPI Services, Inc., Business Loan Brokers. And she's also a very loyal um, LA World Affairs Council Town Hall member. And she's been a very active participant of the Dan Schnur Political Report since its inception um, in June 2020. So Anita, please take it away and ask your question. Thank you so much. So Dan, real briefly, I wanted to touch on the subject of the media's portrayal of the Biden controversy, if you want to call it that. I try and do balanced viewing, as you encourage us to do, but I can't do Fox, and I'm veering away from MSNBC. So what I do on YouTube is I try and watch former Republican channel, people who are former Republicans, I like Michael Steele or The Bulwark when um, George Conway's on and Midas type. So I think I get a balance. And I find that people are kinder, the former Republicans are kinder to Biden than some of the Democrats are sometimes. So I can't come up with an opinion one way or the other. So I want to know, what do you think? Do you think that the coverage has been fair? You know, Biden himself has raised this question. His interview with George Stephanopoulos, of course, got a much larger amount of attention. But on Monday, on the first night of the Republican convention, Biden did an interview with Lester Holt of NBC. And a couple of times, as you may have seen, Anita, challenged Holt very aggressively, saying, well, wait a minute, why are you focusing on me? The other guy told 28 lies in the debate. How come you're not going after that? And Holt really couldn't give the true answer. But I'll tell you what I think it is. If Republicans, Republican congressional leaders and large numbers of Republican voters, or upset or dissatisfied with Trump's debate performance, it would have become a big media story. I think the reason that media covered it so aggressively is because of the Democratic reaction. It's fairly predictable that if a Republican does something wrong, Democrats get upset, and if a Democrat does something wrong, Republicans get, some, get upset. But when voters get upset with the leader of their own party, particularly in a high stakes presidential election, that's news. And I think it's worth noting, and I don't usually defend the media, but I'll give them some props here. Before the debate, which is, I'll do this the other way, after the debate, the New York Times poll showed that 72% of Americans thought that Biden was too old to be president. You know what? When they asked that same poll question a month earlier, 65% of Americans thought that Biden was too old to be president. And the media didn't cover that, not because they were trying to protect Joe Biden, but simply because they didn't find it to be as newsworthy. But when in the aftermath of the debate, not just Biden's opponents, but his own allies became very vocally critical, I think that's really what drove the story forward more than anything else. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Uh, and uh, it clarifies a lot. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anita, not just for a really, really smart question, but as Katie said, you've been one of our all-star members uh, for a long time now. And you know, I started doing these webinars, as you know, in the spring of 2020. And having you involved 
both in the larger webinar settings, but also in the 30 minute post game sessions for members. It's always been terrific to hear your really smart questions and insights. So thank you so, so much. You are welcome. Thank you. Okay. All right. Katie, should we let other people in on this? Yeah, definitely. Um, so first of all, we're getting a couple questions on Project 2025. So what's your viewpoint on Project 2025 and its push by the GOP? Okay. Well, so Project 2025, as I think most of you know, but just to be clear, is a set of policy proposals put together by the Heritage Foundation, uh, a noted conservative think tank, and other conservative activists, many of whom have ties to Donald Trump. But it's a very aggressively conservative platform, in some ways much more conservative than Trump himself has been in his speeches and his statements. And so a couple of weeks ago, Trump was asked about it and was very dismissive of the 2025, 2025 project. He said, I don't know who they are. I don't have anything to do with them. Now, that's somewhat of an exaggeration. He knows who some of them are, and he does have some relationships with them. But to be fair to Trump, they are putting together a series of policy proposals um, independent of his campaign. And while it would be very surprising if he did not adopt some of them, if he were elected president again in November, this is not part of any formal decision-making structure within his campaign or his own apparatus. The Democrats, understandably, are pointing out some of the most strident conservative proposals in the, in the report and are attempting to tie them to Trump or to other Republican candidates. But Trump, even though he does have known associations with many of the people involved in the development of this project, does have some deniability because he and his campaign advisors have said from the very beginning that anyone who is not employed by the campaign is not empowered to speak on his behalf. Right now, Katie, it's a litmus test. If you like Donald, if, if you like Donald Trump, you probably love the 2025 project. Um, if you don't think highly of Donald Trump, then this is yet one more reason to oppose him. Um, but I think Trump himself is wary that while some of the proposals may be popular with conservatives, they may be much more controversial with other voters. That's why we see him doing his best to keep his distance from them. Got it. Thank you so much. And for our next question, this audience member asked, what do you think about former candidates whom Trump has demeaned or those like J.D. Vance who have publicly spoken out against Trump now speaking in his favor? Well, I guess a couple quick thoughts. One, it's fairly standard for defeated primary candidates to come around and support the nominee. We saw Bernie Sanders being very supportive of Biden back in 2020. We've seen Republican defeated candidates who've been supportive of Mitt Romney and John McCain and George Bush in the past. So harsh words that are exchanged in the heat of a primary generally tend to slip away in a general election when the party comes together to defeat its opponent. That's one hand. On the other hand, Trump, as is the case in so many other areas, is exceptional. Number one, with the harshness with which he had attacked these other candidates, the kind of language he's used to criticize them uh, would have made it much more difficult in past years for those candidates to come back around. You may remember in 2016, Ted Cruz gave a speech to the Republican convention in which he very pointedly did not endorse Donald Trump. Marco Rubio and other Republicans who'd run against him were somewhat more circumspect also. But what's happened over the last eight years is leading Republicans both in office and not have recognized the strength of the grassroots support that Trump enjoys. And the overwhelming majority of them have decided that it's better to swallow their pride and fall into line in order to preserve their, uh, their own political prospects going forward. So on one hand, not all that unusual in terms of the dynamic, but the intensity of it, much, much more extreme. And so it does speak to the kind of hold that Trump has over the Republican Party base right now and how unified the party is behind him that so many of his erstwhile opponents uh, have fallen into line and spoke to the convention, praising him very uh, assiduously on Tuesday night. 
Okay, and switching gears a little bit to uh, to the next topic, is it true that only Kamala Harris could tap the Biden Harris store chest of existing donations? Okay, so even if Biden's fundraising isn't going as well as they wanted it to be, as we mentioned earlier, he's raised an immense amount of money for his campaign. Um, campaign party lawyers are looking into this question right now. And they all believe that if Harris, who's already on the ticket, became the nominee, it would be no problem at all to shift all that money into her campaign for president. But if Whitmer or Shapiro or Newsom or someone else became the nominee, there's actually a disagreement in how easy or how difficult it would be to move that money over. My own feeling is that given the very large number of wealthy Americans and the very large number of grassroots Americans who donate money online is that a nominee other than Harris would be able to raise that money back. But at least right now, there'd be fewer questions about whether the ticket could use that funding if Harris were the nominee as opposed to someone else. But again, my own personal opinion is I think the Democratic nominee, whoever he is or she is, will have more than enough money to mount a competitive race. That's not what's going to decide this election. Okay, super interesting. And if Harris runs, who would be her best running mate? Well, uh, one of the biggest concerns about Harris as a candidate uh, is that in order to win those working class voters in the swing states we talked about, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, over and over again. Um, you need a candidate who can communicate with those voters. Again, that's how Biden became the nominee back in 2020. Kamala Harris is a very, very smart woman. And she's a very talented politician who after struggling early in Biden's term, has really come into her own in particular as a spokesperson on behalf of the critical issue of abortion. But she is the former district attorney of San Francisco. In those working class blue collar workers in Rust Belt states might not find the same comfort level with her that they found with Biden. So if Harris were the nominee, my own feeling is it would do her well to find a running mate who just like Vance has the potential to do for Trump can communicate with those key sets of voters in those critical swing states. Whitmer is the governor of Michigan. Shapiro is the governor of Pennsylvania. Uh, there are other Democrats around the country who have demonstrated an ability to talk to these voters, but that would be the criteria I would look for, knowing that the election is going to be decided in those three upper Midwestern states. And a lot of questions coming in about some potential nominees that we haven't discussed yet. So what about Hillary Clinton as a nominee? Um, what about Liz Cheney or Mark Kelly? So three really interesting questions, and there's, of course, dozens of others that we won't get to tonight. The good news is when we gather the first night of the Democratic Convention in August, we'll either know by then or we'll have an absolutely fascinating conversation about who the nominee is going to turn out to be over those next four days. Uh, quickly, uh, one of the national polls asked about Clinton as the nominee, and Hillary Clinton did better than any other Democrat, the exception of Kamala Harris. My own feeling is that's primarily a matter of name recognition. She's simply much better known than Gretchen Whitmer or Westmore or Josh Shapiro or Gavin Newsom. And I don't know that as the campaign progressed, that name recognition would continue to serve her particularly well. Uh, second, I think it's extremely unlikely, borderline impossible, that the Democrats would pick a Republican whether Liz Cheney or any other, to be on their ticket. Um, the the new, No Labels movement talked earlier about putting together a third party ticket with one Democrat and one Republican and talked about Republicans like Cheney as possible members of that ticket. But that would be very difficult to pull off at this point, and I can't see the Democrats wanting to go in that direction. Mark Kelly is interesting. The new senator from, relatively new senator from Arizona, former astronaut, the husband of former Senator Gabrielle Giffords, who was tragically shot in her home state of Arizona 
a few years ago and forced to step down from the Senate in order to concentrate on her recovery. Um, Kelly is an interesting candidate. I feel like he is, and he would certainly help in a key swing state like Arizona. Um, I would, and this is purely subjective, I would not put him quite at the level of plausibility as the seven or eight people who we named earlier, but maybe half a notch below that. He's the kind of person who would be a slight surprise to be one of the contenders, but not a large surprise. Okay, perfect. And I think we have time for one, maybe two more if we're, if we're lucky. So why do you think Biden's campaign thought it was wise to have a debate with Trump and to have it before the conventions? So the Biden campaign was very direct about this. They believe that once voters saw the campaign as a binary choice between Biden and Trump, that Biden would benefit. A lot of voters, according to public opinion polls, did not believe that Trump would be the Republican nominee. And so the Biden's advisors believed that by putting them on a debate stage early, that that would crystallize the choice and work to Biden's benefit. Um, of course, just the opposite happened. Biden struggled through that debate mightily. And it reminded me of the first debate from the 1984 election when Ronald Reagan, who then in his early 70s, which was generally thought to, in that era to be too old to run for president, Reagan really struggled in his first debate against Walter Mondale. And there were a lot of articles and a lot of discussion about whether he was too old to be president. The difference was, is that first debate took place in September, not in June. The second debate took place two weeks later. And because Reagan, with just as large of an audience, performed much more effectively, he put those concerns to rest. In retrospect, pushing for the early debate in order to crystallize the choice between Biden and Trump may more than anything else end up having been the decision that may doom Biden's campaign simply by depriving him of the follow-up that Reagan had to demonstrate his acuity and his abilities. Great, and we do have time for one more question, I believe. So thank you, Dan, for, for all of that analysis thus far. Um, last question I wanna ask is, what is the process needed to get the 40 delegates for the Democratic nomination? So a couple of things. One, there is no formal process yet. We have one member of the Democratic National Committee who has proposed a threshold for deciding who the contenders would be. James Carville, uh, Bill Clinton's former advisor, has an even simpler process for picking the competitors. He says that Bill Clinton and Barack Obama ought to pick eight Democrats. Just the two of them ought to decide who the eight most plausible candidates would be and go forward with those. What former Governor Walters is suggesting, though, is that each potential candidate essentially would have petitions, either on paper or online, and that an accredited delegate to the Democratic National Convention would sign that petition on behalf of one or more potential candidates. And any candidate who got a certain number to sign, whether 40 or 50 or 60 or some other, would be elevated into this competition, the debates, the speeches, whatever the, whatever the process happened to be. Um, I would say that at this point, if Biden does not stay on the ticket, it's much more likely than not that Harris becomes the nominee just because the process of setting up a competitive path forward would be so complicated and time is so short for the Democrats. But there's a lot of Democrats who have great concerns about Harris's abilities as a candidate. And many of them have said that the idea of removing a candidate from the ticket simply because he can't win and replacing him with someone who can't win doesn't make a lot of sense. So there will be a lot of fluttering over the next week or so. And if this is to make no mistake, if this isn't decided within the weeks, next week to 10 days, it won't happen. Um, but while the questioner asks a really, really smart question about that process, I should emphasize that it's very informal and very speculative at this point. Um, the most well-connected people who I read and hear and listen to suspect that Biden will spend this weekend talking to his very small group of advisors and very small group of family members to make a decision. So it's entirely possible 
that by this weekend or early next week, we will have a much clearer sense than we have today as to what the general election race will look like. But either way, we will be back here in August when the Democrats meet. And as I said earlier, on that first Monday of the convention, we'll either know who their nominee is or we won't. Thanks as always to all of you for joining us. We're very, very grateful to have you. And although I went on at some length last time, um, I hope you'll join me again in thanking my colleague and my good friend, Katie Gilman, for the wonderful work she has done with us over her time with World Affairs Council Town Hall. We're very grateful uh, to have had you working with us, Katie. I'm really lucky to have made a friend in you and I wish you only the best going forward. Thank you so much. Yeah, it, it's been just an incredible part of my career to be a part of these discussions every month and I will really miss it, but I will be uh, in the audience moving forward. And thanks again, Dan, for all of your really spectacular analysis tonight. So uh, I'll pass it over to Richard who can who can close us out here, but thank you again. Well, thanks so much, Katie. Uh, and I, we're we're really gonna miss you. Not uh, obviously, you're gonna be the audience, and you'll be with us. But we're gonna miss you as the moderator. You've just done a wonderful job. And I have to say, uh, Ma Madison All, who is gonna be terrific, has big sho shoes to fill. And uh, I know she can do it, but but it's a uh, it's gonna be tough. So thank you so much for all you've done. And and Dan, wow, what a what a session. This has really been interesting. Uh, the, we, thank you so much for your analysis. Uh, and not only on Anita's question, but I think it, this this is such an interesting time now. So many factors going on. Uh, you've helped us uh, understand this with, with, in this very fluid environment. And I think the number of questions, uh, many that uh, were asked, and I, I know uh, so many wanted to, we couldn't get to them all, but, but thank you so much for helping us understand this really complex and and fluid situation now. So I would really appreciate it. And uh, Anita, thank you for your question. A very, very good question. Thanks to all of our members uh, for, uh, and, and for audience members to, for your questions. Uh, I, I wanna do, say one thing, um, you know, following this, we, we have a members only session. I should, I should mention that as Dan uh, said earlier in, in, the, uh, in the event here, that the Republican, uh, convention is going on right now. We don't know when Donald Trump is speaking, but uh, we, sus we suspect it could be any time. So it, the members only session will be shorter tonight because we'll need to truncate that if if and when, uh, well, when uh, Trump well, gets we'll, started to speak. We'll, we'll try to get in the whole half an hour, but uh... We'll, we'll we'll see what uh, we'll see what comes out of Milwaukee, right? Yeah. Well, we may need. I rephrase it. Thank you, Dan. We may need to to uh, close that out a bit earlier, but hopefully we'll get to as many questions as possible. But again, I thank all of you for uh, for joining us tonight. And one last reminder, please uh, do if, if those who are able to sponsor uh, Dan's program. I know you'll uh, you, you we all want to. If if you are, please contact us. Uh, and but your donations and memberships. Would, uh, to the Los Angeles World Affairs Council town hall will be very, very helpful. So uh, for, those, those, for those members who are joining us, thanks, we'll see you shortly. Uh, but uh, thank you all for joining us and have a great night. Thanks again, Dan. Thanks everybody.